Before The Wind Waker, I wasn't a big Zelda fan. I knew about the series thanks to my older brother owning both N64 titles as well as Twilight Princess. At a young age, I wasn't a fan of the dark direction these games had, so I steered clear. One day at a video rental store though, I saw a copy of Wind Waker on the shelf and was immediately enamoured by its visuals. I took it home, put it into my Wii, and played it over and over again. When I got home from school, I played Wind Waker. When I had a free weekend, I played Wind Waker. It was my childhood, and played a big part in developing my taste to this day. Even though I and many other players enjoyed this new direction, it didn't resonate as well with older fans. Choosing to instead go for a cell shaded look, this new entry had foregone the art styles of its predecessors and went for a more whimsical and light-hearted tone, something more akin to a cartoon. This change in art style would remain divisive amongst fans of the series, as it was a departure from what they were used to. The criticism did not end there, however, as multiple parts of the game were also lambasted from the means of traversal to the game's pacing. Though, despite it all, The Wind Waker is still fondly remembered in the eyes of many such as myself for its vibrant and colourful look, the superb soundtrack, and the highly expressive and memorable characters. It is for these reasons that I believe that The Wind Waker is a captivating delight. Opening with a retelling of the events in Ocarina of Time as passed down through generations, the story speaks of an evil king who threatened peace, and the hero clothed in green who sealed him away. This young boy would later be known as the Hero of Time, and his heroic deeds would go down in legend. However, the evil king would escape from his seal and return to continue his nefarious bidding. With the hero gone and all hope seemingly lost, the people of the land knelt to their gods and prayed for a miracle. What became of that kingdom would be forgotten to time, but the story of the land and the hero would live on. A place where that story is still treasured is on Outset Island, where it is customary for boys to be garbed in green when they come of age. One such boy is a sleepy lad named Link. Being woken up on his birthday by his younger sister, Aral, Link is gifted the formal green clothes by their grandma. After begrudgingly putting them on, Link goes to fetch his sister for supper, but before setting off, Aral gives Link a telescope as a present. Using it to observe the faraway postman, their attention is taken by a gigantic bird carrying a young girl in its talons, being hunted by pirates. After getting shot down by a rock, the bird drops the young girl inside the forest on top of the island. Realising that they can't leave the girl in danger, Link grabs a sword to rescue the girl, and after clearing the forest of monsters, the young mistress has... a bit of a rude awakening. The young girl is introduced as Tetra, the leader of the band of pirates. Exiting the forest, Aral comes to greet Link and Tetra, but as she's about to cross, she is swooped up by the gigantic bird. <laughs> Acting on pure instinct, Link tries to save his sister with... middling results. <laughs> Wanting nothing more than to bring back his sister, Link requests that he join the pirates to rescue Aral from a large stronghold known as the Forsaken Fortress. Being told that he needs more than just a sword, Link goes back to his grandma's house to take the decorative shield as a means of defense, only to find it missing. Accepting that she can't stop the determined boy from going off to bring Aral home, Grandma hands the shield over to Link, and after a heartfelt goodbye to all the islanders, Link and the pirates set sail to the Forsaken Fortress. Thank you. 
I love the introduction on Outside Island. From the way it starts out as just another peaceful day, to one of the saddest with Errol's kidnapping and Link's departure. It only hits harder when Link notices his grandma looking off into the distance, knowing that she's lost both of her grandkids in one day. Then we're quickly taken back to reality with Tetra, making fun of Link and offering him a chance to run home. Upon arrival, the crew devise a plan to get Link in without tripping the outside defences, where Tetra comes up with an ingenious plan. Sending him in via a barrel and a catapult, Link braces for his one-way flight with no returns, and the plan goes... about as well as one would expect. With his sword gone and having no means of defending himself, Link sneaks his way to the top and finds both his sword and arrow locked up with several other young girls. But before he's able to free her, the same bird snatches Link away and takes him to his master before he's tossed out into the ocean. Link is woken up by a voice and finds himself inside a boat, only to realise that the boat can talk. He introduces himself as the King of Red Lions, and reveals that he has been watching Link ever since he infiltrated the Forsaken Fortress, chastising the boy for such a brash attempt. Mentioning the large bird's master, the king reveals the master's name to be Ganon, the same one from Ocarina of Time. Since escaping from his seal, the world is once again being threatened by his devious designs. Acknowledging that rescuing his sister also means defeating Ganon, the duo form a partnership and set off on their journey to rescue Errol and thwart Ganon. I believe the infiltration of the Forsaken Fortress is a strong story beat that serves to temper Link's resolve. Being only inches away from rescuing his sister, he snatched and tossed away into the sea moments later. With the King of Red Lions offer for a second chance to rescue Errol, he agrees without any hesitation. This shows Link's unwavering resolve to bring her home safely, following in the familiar footsteps of past heroes. This sets up into a story of cooperation between the King of Red Lions and Link, with their bond only strengthening as the story progresses. Although I love the darker tones of Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, Wind Waker's light-hearted tone always feels refreshing to me. The vibrant colour palette along with the distinct cast of characters that Link meets along his quest stand out very well, and makes visiting every key destination an enjoyable one. Moving away from the Nintendo 64 to more powerful hardware allowed for more detailed character models, and no character demonstrates that better than Link. His exaggerated facial expressions and over-the-top movements ooze charm and personality, making him an endearing and entertaining character to get behind. Despite this, he's still headstrong and unwavering to complete his goals, making him not only one of the most visually interesting incarnations, but also one of the most captivating. The young pirate leader Tetra commands a room as well as she commands her crew. She initially comes across as assertive and cunning, demanding the respect of her men. Underneath those layers, she is a kind and compassionate person. Getting to see those glimpses of her caring about others such as Link and Errol helps add more to her character, even if some of her ideas don't always go according to plan. Despite this, she is a valuable ally to Link, 
sacrificing the prospect of treasure to make sure that others are safe and happy, truly making her a pirate with a heart of gold. This version of Ganondorf is one of his strongest from a writing perspective. Following his defeat in Ocarina of Time and getting sealed away, he has had a long time to evaluate and learn from his failure. He has grown smarter and tactful with age, knowing better than to underestimate the wielders of the other Triforce pieces. But he also has his moments of perspective, reminiscing on his home and how harsh its conditions were in contrast to the lush green plains of Hyrule. That in turn made him envious and was what made him begin his conquest. Although there are very few of these lines, knowing what gave him his motivations and feeling so he can be sympathised with makes him such an incredibly written character, and in my personal opinion, the best version of Ganondorf to date. <laughs> The jump to newer generations of consoles expanded on what was possible for the series, as Wind Waker introduced a lot of new concepts, but also refined what worked in the previous entries. Combat is still largely the same in terms of performing sword combos and using tools to defeat enemies, but the introduction of new and returning enemy types meant that Link's toolset had to expand, and so it did. When an enemy is about to attack, a prompt will appear on screen. When pressed at the correct time, Link will dodge the foe's assault and counterattack either with a backslice or a helm splitter. This parry attack adds on to the patient style of play first introduced back in Ocarina of Time, rewarding players for striking when the time is right. Although, it does make some fights against enemies such as Dark Nuts feel as though they're boiled down to wait for the parry prompt, cut off the armor, and go to town. If Link is fortunate enough, an enemy can drop their weapon and Link can use it to defend himself. In many cases, these weapons can be stronger than Link's current sword, and disarming the enemy is pivotal to having a better chance of winning fights. Do note though that these weapons are much larger and heavier than Link's standard tools, so they do carry some risk with them. In the worst case scenario though, just chuck them. New items such as the Deku Leaf and the Grappling Hook serve dual purposes each having their own uses in combat and exploration. The Deku Leaf is great for staggering enemies with a large gust of wind, and is invaluable when gliding across large distances. The Grappling Hook can be used to temporarily stun foes to steal their treasure, while also allowing Link to swing across gaps whenever there's a target to latch onto, which is made easier thanks to one of the best additions to the series, the Free Cam. Moving away from the Nintendo 64 controller to a more conventional one, allowed for a right stick, making Wind Waker the first 3D Zelda game with a free moving camera. No more having to repeatedly press Z to reposition the camera, it can now be changed to whatever angle is preferable for the situation. Needless to say, the free moving camera is an amazing addition, and just feels right. Of course, pressing the left trigger is still used to lock on and shift the camera behind Link, which is imperative for combat. After joining forces with the King of Red Lions, the pair are able to traverse all across the Great Sea and sail from island to island. The more items Link obtains throughout his quest, the more abilities of the boat he's able to use, such as using bombs for a cannon and the aforementioned grappling hook to salvage sunken treasure off the seafloor. But for a boat to sail, it needs the wind's favour. How does it get it? That's where the eponymous Wind Waker comes in a magical conductor's baton that allows Link to conduct songs that have varying effects. From changing the direction of the wind, to summoning a giant cyclone, or changing the time of day. The wind's requiem is used to change the wind in any of the eight main compass directions. Used in tandem with the boat's sail or the Deku Leaf, this song is an indispensable asset for reaching Link's intended destination. The one criticism I will fault the game on is having to use the wind's requiem to change the wind's direction every time a player wants to go a different direction. It's a pain and can drag down the pacing. Luckily, in the HD version, a new item was added called the Swift Sail. When activated, 
the boat sails much faster and changes the direction of the wind automatically. A very welcome and needed change. Speaking further on changes in the HD version, the Tingle Tuner from the original has been replaced by the Tingle Bottle, an item that allows a player to send messages out to sea via Miiverse and... Wait, what? Oh, right. I forgot about that. Thanks a lot, you lousy m- Anyways, other changes include an added difficulty known as Hero Mode, where damage taken is doubled and there are no heart drops in the overworld. This has been a standard addition to most Zelda entries since Skyward Sword, offering a challenge for players wanting a harder experience, and in Wind Waker, that is welcome since it is often regarded as one of the easiest Zelda games in terms of difficulty. The final big change was a quest required to finish the game. There comes a point where Link must scour the Great Sea for certain objects, let's call them the Triumph Forks, and only when he collects all of them can he access the final area. The problem with this is Link must find treasure charts to find the objects and salvage them, but they must first be deciphered by... Aw, oh, you son of a bitch! Tingle here will offer his services to decipher them at a hefty cost, and in the original GameCube release, that costed over 3,000 rupees. Thankfully, in the remaster, the objects are placed in some locations where there were originally charts, and you only need to decipher three charts as opposed to eight. The additions that Wind Waker brought for combat and exploration, such as the parry attack, Link's new tools, and the introduction of the free roaming camera, helped to make the core gameplay loop feel more cohesive and fluid than ever before. Even though some may disagree, I personally enjoy sailing across the Great Sea, and the improvements included with the HD version make exploring the world a much better experience. <laughs> Brimming with many different land masses and races scattered all throughout, the Great Sea is a vast expanse home to various walks of life. From the whimsical nature of Windfall, to the secluded Forest Haven, or the quiet and serene island of Outset. Many races had to change and evolve to better suit sea life. The once cheery Kukiri became a race of wooden people known as the Koroks, who live under the protection of the Deku Tree and travel the Great Sea using their leaves. The Rito people descended from the aquatic Zora tribe, growing wings to fly and offering their worship to a giant dragon god. Every race offers their own sort of services, with the Rito running a mail courier service and the Koroks sprouting trees to build forests. Even Ganon's monsters have found ways to adapt to the open sea, from the Bokoblins and Moblins that occupy submarines and platforms, or threats such as Sea Hats and Georgs that can and will chase Link down. The new and returning races to Wind Waker are all visually distinct from one another and two characters of the same race are distinguishable thanks to the game's art style making certain features stand out. The stylized character models and expressions combined with the cel shaded graphics give Wind Waker its iconic cartoony look, making it in my opinion one of the most gorgeous looking Zelda games. When comparing it to the art styles of the Nintendo 64 titles and even the subsequent entry, Wind Waker has, to my mind, aged like a fine wine managing to still look beautiful 20 years after its release due to its artistic direction. This art direction is best displayed in many of the game's dungeons, and no other displays this as well as the Tower of the Gods. After collecting three sacred pearls, a gigantic tower rises up from the sea as a test for the young hero's courage. As this is a test to see if Link is worthy, the Tower of the Gods makes use of everything that Link has at his arsenal. From using the boat's cannon to destroy walls, the grappling hook to swing across bottomless pits, and most interestingly, the Wind Waker itself. To progress further in the dungeon, Link is taught a tune known as the Command Melody. With it, Link is able to take control of various statues around the tower to complete certain puzzles and advance further up. The Command Melody is a clever addition to Link's kit, allowing him to be in two places at once and creating very interesting puzzles for not only having multiple people or objects, but having varying weights as well. Ending with one of the best boss fights in the game, Godan, 
The Tower of the Gods cements itself as one of the strongest dungeons that Wind Waker has to offer, and while it's no stone tower, it's still phenomenal in its own regard. And speaking of phenomenal, the game's soundtrack and audio design is nothing short of spectacular. No longer restricted by the limitations of the Nintendo 64, Wind Waker's score is filled to the brim with outstanding tracks, all with a wide range of acoustic, percussion, and wind instruments. For example, songs such as Windfall Island, Forest Haven, and my personal favourite, Dragon Roost Island. Dragon Roost's theme is incredibly infectious. The pan flutes playing the main melody always compel me to hum along, the percussions invite me to tap my hands in time with the rhythm, and that oh so catchy guitar work makes reaching the chorus every time a joy. Dragon Roost Island is a shining example of how top-notch Wind Waker's soundtrack is, and many of the tracks in the game follow suit. Since this is the HD remaster, quite a few tracks were re-recorded with higher fidelity audio, and make the already impeccable score even better. The audio design also plays a crucial role in combat. Whenever Link lands a hit, an audio cue will play upon impact. Depending on the strength of the hit, the intensity of the audio will change, so something as strong as a jump attack has a very prominent sound. The emphasis on the blows that Link connects always feels like he's gaining the upper hand in the fight, encouraging him to keep up his assault and come out on top as the victor. The design of the world, the characters that inhabit it, and the audio all bring a wonderful sense of endearment and wonder. Married with the cel shader graphics, Wind Waker is not only one of the most visually captivating, but also one of the most charming games in the series. If it isn't clear enough, I love this game. When I first saw it on the shelf, I was gripped by the sense of curiosity and adventure it offered by navigating the Great Sea. It's kept me gripped for over a decade, and always has me coming back for more. If this video has convinced you to play the Wind Waker, which I hope it has, play the HD version on the Wii U. It is the definitive way to play the game, with the audio and graphics updates, along with gameplay improvements such as the Swift Sail and the optional Hero Mode. These improvements, on top of what is already a gorgeous game, makes every playthrough an absolute joy. From the entertaining characters, the refinements to combat and means of exploration, to the outright beautiful art style, they all come together to create what I can only call a captivating delight. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed, clicking the like and subscribe buttons is a great way of showing support. But before this video ends, I have some people to shout out, along with some announcements. Thanks to Juice for helping with the script writing and offering his insight. He has a channel here on YouTube under the Juice Box, where he does character analysis videos on characters from Doki Doki Literature Club and Sonic the Hedgehog. You can also check out his podcast channel for a recent episode on Tears of the Kingdom, which I was featured in. Be warned though, it is nearly 5 hours long. Special thank you to Cartarian for helping with the script writing as well as the voice direction for the recorded lines. And finally, thanks to all of you for your support of the Majora's Mask video. Never did I expect that it would get over 50,000 views. You're all bloody legends, and I cannot be more thankful. That being said, why did it take 7 months for this video to come out? Well, life got busy. It was a mix of managing my mental health, wanting to play other games that were already out at the time, and probably the biggest contributor, playing a lot of KOF 15. 
In fact, I've started running a weekly online bracket for the scene here called The King of Oceania. It's been running every Tuesday night at 7.30pm AEDT, and we've been growing as a scene so much. So if you want to come see some good as KOF, you can watch past streams on the VOD channel linked in the description. As for the future, I'm definitely going to continue this series of Zelda videos, but I want to branch off into some other stuff, so don't expect Twilight Princess until sometime in the new year. If you want to keep up to date with me, you can follow my Twitter and Twitch at the handle on screen. But until next time, take care.